Hello, I'm Philip Hooker, VP of Strategic Programs at Software AG, who are initiator of the open source ThinEdge.io project. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to this seventh ThinEdge.io community meetup. We've got a range of presentations and practical demonstrations from the ThinEdge.io team and contributors, which cover what's new in the latest version, how it can be used in extended, and real implementation examples. But before we begin, I want to cover a few housekeeping items. We're using Teams webinar for this meetup. So if you hover your cursor over the main window, the webinar control bar will be shown. The control bar allows you to raise your hand if you have a question, show the meeting chat sidebar, view participants, and leave the webinar. If you have any questions during the session, you can submit them through the chat or raise your hand at the end of the session. The presenters will answer questions at the end of their session, but please feel free to ask questions at any time during the presentations. For those with the raised hands, we'll unmute your mic so you can ask your question directly when called on. We'll also launch a couple of polls uh, to capture your opinion on important topics. These will initially appear as pop-ups, but will also be available in the meeting chat sidebar for later review. If you want to enlarge the display to full screen or check your audio settings, please click the ellipsis three dot symbol in the control bar for a sub menu. I'll be introducing the agenda and our first speaker in just a few minutes. But first, I'd like to say a few words about the ThinEdge.io community. The ThinEdge.io community is an online and in-person tech enthusiast group who are excited about the practical implementation of ThinEdge.io the open source cloud agnostic IoT framework designed for resource constrained edge devices. We're an eclectic group of IoT, OT and IT professionals from the core development team, contributors and the open source community, all experienced in the use of industry proven security, connectivity and software management methods for lightweight deployments. During the sessions, we aim to replicate ThinEdge.io's no nonsense approach with interactive technology demonstrations so you can learn from both our successes and challenges. And as a recent note, with the rebirth of in-person events, we are pleased to see ThinEdge.io, the ThinEdge.io project being uh, promoted by many of the contributing partners at the recent Hanover Messe trade show. Trade show. This trade show is one of the world's largest dedicated to industrial de uh, de development. Many partners were showing products with uh, embedded, the, which actually embedded ThinEdge.io. And there were numerous demonstrations that incorporated ThinEdge.io in different solutions, including those on the AWS, Microsoft, and Cumbus and Software AG stands, as you can see in the slide. So we're continuously evolving our approach to allow more time for technical deep dives and interactions with the ThinEdge.io team and contributors. We'll kick off with a brief recap of the updates of release 0 0.10 from the ThinEdge.io team. Then we'll immediately move to technical sessions from the ThinEdge.io team, which cover an overview of the refactor initiative and its benefits, firmware management of child devices, remote access uh, with ThinEdge.io. Then we'll actually change gears with the contributor demonstrations, which cover the container management on edge devices. And time allowing, all the sessions will be followed by a short Q&A. This then rolls into an open Guru Bar and networking session towards the end. So the Things to Our project has been progressing at a rapid pace. I would like to introduce um, the presenter of our first talk, Ruben Miller, product owner from the Finished IO team, who will outline the new features and updates to Finished IO that are now available in release 0 0.10. Ruben. Over to you. Hi, hi Phil, and hi everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, so I wanted to run through the updates, uh, what we included in the release 0.10. Uh, so some of you may have seen it from the previous uh, release video that we had, uh, but I wanted to go again on some of the great features that we delivered in this version. So starting, there we are starting through the, the main features for adding to our cloud connectors that we now support. Uh, so we've added the AWS IoT support, which is a great adding to the additional Azure Comelocity and now AWS. Uh, so continuing the journey there for being cloud agnostic. 
And then we had a great contribution by an external contributor this time to add child device support for Azure IoT. So that's great to see that everyone's getting a bit more involved and also contributing to the Rust project directly, um, which enables us to then scale out in the future. Then we have some great community uh, features regarding Comelocity. Uh, so we've added the firmware management support for child devices, which allows you to then manage all of the firmware running on the child devices. And we do all of the complicated stuff like downloads and all that, and we'll have a demo on that later. Then we introduced the software monitoring feature where you can then uh, show the running state of each of the services. Uh, and that will also be presented in the containerization demo later on. And we'll have the demo on the remote cloud access, or so the cloud remote access feature, uh, where it allows you to better troubleshoot your IoT devices uh, securely from the cloud. Then as we kind of develop through the project, we also have a lot of kind of general improvements. Um, so we have a few kind of configuration improvements where we allow kind of the configuration of external uh, MQT brokers now, um, and also the um, upcoming containerization preparation uh, that we are able to set all of the configuration through environment variables. And we also have an official APT repository, so you can install all of the Tej components via a standard APT get install. So maybe just to dive down a little bit on the containerization preparation, because um, it's quite a, important and a kind of a common asked for feature. Uh, so the containerization, we have a bit of prep work that to better support running ThinEdge in containers. Um, so the number one setting or number one kind of feature that is great to support is being able to set all of the Tetch TOML settings via environment variables. So that means you no longer need to then manually create uh, TOML files inside your container, and you can also then set the container settings at runtime, so when you spawn the container, um, which is very, very convenient, and then you allow the users to also customize their environment uh, to suit their needs. Um, and then in addition with the uh, non-local host, um, uh, sorry, with the MQT client support, uh, now each of the Tedge components can connect to an MQT broker, which isn't running on the local host. So previously, this was a little bit cumbersome to uh, configure, but now we've kind of decoupled it from the, like the hosting of the MQT broker and the client connections. So now it's very, very simple to then run the MQC broker in a different container and then communicate it through the DNS name, for example. Uh, so that's all very convenient now to then use. So you should be then set up for when we introduce in the future, have our own container, which is running then ThinEdge, and you can easily pull it into your different projects. Then this shows the APT repository. So with the very generous contribution from CloudSmith, um, which provide the free OSS hosting, um, you can now download all of the packages from the APT repository. Uh, you can even browse through the link so you can kind of um, see what's there, see what kind of um, the development versions that we have or the official versions. Uh, so it's all available there uh, for use. And you can also then pull it in from, so create your own meta packages maybe in Debian, uh, and then link into the ThinEdge packages, um, which makes it more convenient to then install your dependencies for your project, because you can have um, take advantage of the Debian package management and the dependency management, which you get by default. So those are the main um, highlights from it. Um, so like always, you can always just check out the, the GitHub repository and also the release notes for the full uh, details of what changed. And you can also see what we're kind of uh, cooking up uh, for the next release. So thanks and back to you, Phil. Excellent. Thanks, Ruben. Let's start our, our technical sessions. Code refactoring is a process of restarting, restructuring existing code without changing its behavior. To improve its non-functional attributes like design, maintainability, performance, and also integration with other services. With ThinEdge.io being increasingly assessed for use in critical infrastructure, high performance is essential. So 
I would like to introduce Didier Venzek, Principal Software Engineer from the Finesia I team, who will walk through the project's refactoring initiative, its concept and approach, and the benefits that have already been realized. So Didier, over to you. Hello, and good afternoon. My name is Didier Venzek, and I'm Software Engineer and leading the Finesia team. And today I'm going to introduce you to uh, the new internal design of Synage. So uh, Synage started two years ago, actually, with an ambitious goal to build an open source IoT framework. And it's ambitious not only because there's a lot to do, but mainly because we have to find where to place the cursor between um, ready to use features and development tools. And if you look to, uh, to what has been done during these two years, we can see this tension. On one side, uh, for instance, we have um, software management with an API that supports new package managers and two daemons, the agents on the mapper that separate cleanly the feature from the cloud specific, uh, specificities. But on the other side, we have the configuration plugin for community, grids for community users, but helpless for others and even not so handy if you, your use case is slightly different. So we introduced this diversity on purpose uh, to discover what is more appropriate for you, uh, our users and their use cases. But now we have to uh, find a path between the two. And uh, so just a small detour first, um, your feedback are, is really important to us. We propose different approaches uh, some of the similar issues and please tell us what is great for you and what is less appropriate. Indeed, your feedback matters to shape the future of Synage and we still have a lot to do. We need to, to improve the container story. As a, we need to uh, have a better uh, child device support, mainly uh, regarding uh, child device registration, authentication, certificates. Uh, yes, we need also, uh, to be honest, we need also to have a lighter uh, uh, synage. Today, uh, adding adding many features, we ended with something that is bigger than expected. We also need to stabilize the API, and to, so, so this API can be used by external contributors. So after two years of discovery, we need to consolidate synage. Today, I will only focus on the internal uh, design. Indeed, to be in position to improve the external lab, to improve how the internal code is organized. And this is what we did uh, during the first uh, this, uh, this year, this first uh, quarter. Uh, sorry. Um, the point of this refactoring is not to has not been to clean up a buggy code base. This, uh, this is not the case. And this is the good part of using Rust. We never experience memory bugs, crashes, or low uh, level concurrency issues. The point of this refactoring is to move fast, to be more flexible, to be able to change our mind. This has been the main counterpart of using Rust. This is definitely not the best tool for prototyping. For instance, we implemented the configuration plugin as an abundant daemon to have early feedback from, uh, from users. And now it should be easy to move that feature inside the community mapper and to support all the device management features in one place. Unfortunately, this has not been the case for and for stupid low level reasons, memory management, resource ownership, and compatible concurrency patterns. To move forward, we need a consistent approach to manage concurrent units of computation. And this approach is the actor model. So called uh, concurrent units of computation that interact uniquely using messages, asynchronous messages. And there is a nice fit between Synage, AIM, and the actor model. Indeed, if you look Synage as a high level, Synage is about connecting subsystem 
the device, the cloud, the child devices using JSON, CSV, over MQTT, HTTP. This must be transparent reading the code. However, this has not been the case, uh, this was not the case six months ago, where everything was mixed between uh, business logic and low level uh, concerns. Using Actor, we are moving where, so, on a, a design where um, this, this coordination aspects are more transparent. But before diving into the details, I want to highlight something. The novelty is not that we are using actors. In fact, we are using them since the beginning. If you look at the, at the community mapper, the, to, on the converter thread, this is an actor. We, since the beginning, we started to use messages, in-memory messages, to uh, interact between uh, different units of computation. Unfortunately, this was not systematic. So the novelty is to have a systematic manner to uh, define actors, to test them, to connect them, and to run them in a, a main process. And to use the same mechanism for MQTT, HTTP, eNotify, timers, uh, and to remove all the words when introduced, unfortunately, uh, to uh, not able to uh, deal with HTTP. So, uh, to look closely to these properties of the actor model, the first point is self-contained messages. The, the point is to, to uh, by contrast, is the, with um, calling a method. Instead of calling a method on some handle, when an, an actor wants to um, have some effect, this effect will be conveyed using a message that that contain everything to, yeah, the, that contains the intent. For instance, if the intent is to send a message of MQTT, we will have a message which type and content defines that this is for MQTT and this is uh, a message to be sent over uh, this uh, topic and uh, using that payload and such and such of uh, MQTT flags. But what is actually done by this uh, message will only be defined by the, uh, the um, recipient. If we uh, to, to send this actually over MQTT, we need to send this message to some actor that behind the scene manage some TCP connection, MQTT connection uh, to the broker and translate this in-memory representation of something to, to, to be done, in that case to send an MQTT message into an action, an effect. Having self-contained messages improve many things. You can understand uh, the actor in isolation. You can test it using fake messages just by looking at the messages that is going in and out uh, the actor. You don't need the true uh, concrete uh, actual uh, MQTT connection to test uh, something. The second point are the explicit states. If you want to implement a workflow between a subsystem, uh, we can call into a, a sequence of interactions using simply um, the async await framework from Rust, something similar to, to what we you, you will find in, uh, say, JavaScript. And this, you, so you have something that is kind of sequential. I first do this, I first say to send a message to a child device, then to await the response, then to send another message to another uh, component, again to wait the response and send back a complete response to, to the cloud. So we could use that, and to, but in that case, we let the compiler manage all the intermediate states. And the demand state is simply I have already sent a message uh, to some child device, and now I'm waiting uh, the response. By contrast, with actors, the state is defined by the program. If an actor has to wait, wait for something, the state of the actor will simply uh, list all the six where I, I already sent this message, I received these two responses, uh, there is a timeout that is running, and everything is in memory. And uh, this um, <clears throat> help to understand 
what is going on. We have a big picture of the actor and all the interactions. Obviously, this is a bit cumbersome because we have to manage explicitly that state while it was done implicitly by the frame, um, Rust uh, compiler before. Next point, uh, unconstrained event loop. Uh, this is a point we discuss a lot in the team because at the very beginning we try to have something that yeah, to, uh, I receive a message and I have to send a response or a stream of response for uh, every input. But in practice, we want to be free to have a lot of uh, patterns. Uh, some uh, actor uh, need to be able to send messages even without even uh, input, so to be a source of uh, messages. Or we can, uh, some other actor, for instance, the HTTP actor, need to be able to send uh, different requests uh, in parallel, concurrently, and to send the response when, they, uh, when received from HTTP. So we need to have a different patterns and to be free. And at the very end, we just have one method just to just uh, yes, uh, the actor. Now it's your time. You have to uh, uh, to run, process your messages, and do what you need to do. And most of our work has been uh, set on the interconnections. We need to be very flexible to be able to. Um, yeah, it's really a combined actors. Uh, I have an actor that works in isolation. I can work a test this actor, but then I, I need to be able to connect this actor to others and to read an application from that. I, I will show you this in a demo. And everything is done using um, leveraging uh, REST. So we have a static compile time checks. An actor cannot send a message to another if the types of these two messages are not compatible. Uh, com compatible. And we also uh, introduced a, a runtime. This runtime is not mandatory. You can test uh, an actor in isolation or even use uh, it uh, without any um, specific um, actor runtime. But if you want, and this is what we will uh, do in practice, you can leverage a runtime that will have a broad view of all the act running actors in an application. For instance, the key uh, feature now for the, uh, using that is um, the ability to shut down everything uh, uh, when you hit the uh, control C key, just to be able to send a message to all the actors, or oh, please stop working cleanly and uh, for graceful shutdown. So I will show you some um, code uh, using a, a very simple uh, basic actor um, that um, has a status from all subcomponents of a device. So the starting point is the global status request. We can suppose that this request will come from the cloud. So the cloud requests uh, the device to uh, provide the status for all the subsystems, all the child devices. And the response will be a map for every subsystem, a status, that the subsystem can be down, have some unknown status, uh, say uh, after a timeout, or be up for uh, since some uh, uptime. So this, is, this will be the protocol between the device and uh, the cloud. And then is, uh, uh, the actor will have to send the request to the, server, to the child devices. And we will have again a status request to all on every child device. And uh, at that time, given, oh, please, uh, can I have the status of this uh, subsystem? And uh, this subsystem will have to respond uh, with its own status uh, of the same type I expected here. When I said that these um, messages are self-contained, it just means that this status request, for instance, can be understood even if I'm not this uh, subtype. I, I, I just can observe the messages that are going inside the system. I can notice that this actor is sending a status request to that other child devices. I don't need to be 
aware and some private channel between the, um, uh, the main device and the child device. All these messages can be understood by any that uh, uh, have access to them. And you have all the information you need to understand, for instance, that the status response is for that system and giving you this status. For the actor itself, um, so the main um, uh, feature of the actor will be this run method. Uh, given some state uh, with the full content of the actor, but not only the state of the actor, but also uh, all the mechanism to send and receive messages from others. And the event loop will be in that case very simple because I just have to receive uh, until I have some message, I will have to process this message depending on the type of message I have. So uh, in that case, I will have uh, either uh, status uh, coming for, uh, request status coming from the cloud or a status response coming from the child devices. The fact that I receive two kinds of uh, messages is defined here. I have a, a type here that I name status input and where I, I can see, uh, list all the um, uh, options. This guy can receive status global status request or uh, uh, local status responses. And via versa, uh, this actor will send a global status response, because we to this request, and will send request, status request, to the child devices. And all these messages will simply be put in a, in a message box. Uh, this message box is the simplest that we can have. Uh, there is just uh, a queue of messages waiting for uh, being processed and an output uh, that can be uh, used by others. But at this level, I just have message in, message out. I have some uh, configuration. Yeah, I, uh, I took a very simple path where the configuration, the list of child devices is simply given um, when the system is built. Obviously, we need something more um, involved uh, in a real system, but that's not, that's not the point. What is interesting is this, this part. Um, this actor um, manages state. When there is a request, this actor will manage the state of all the response uh, being collected, what is going on, what is still pending, and so on. So we will have a, a set of uh, subsystems for which I'm expecting a response and the response all collected. So this is a state at a given point in time of my actor. So I have a, a nice view of what can be um, all the different steps of this system. And if you look to the, um, now to the code itself, you will see it's quite straightforward, straightforward to understand. Obviously, this example is simple, but um, in practice, we use that pattern for uh, now for configuration management, firmware management, and this um, scale very, very uh, uh, nicely. So, uh, for instance, we can uh, just uh, looking the workflow, receive a global response uh, uh, request. Sorry. So, if I'm not already uh, trying to um, uh, probe the status of this then I will start a new request. And starting a request is simply uh, sending a status request to all the subsystem I am aware of and to um, uh, prepare a new state. And this uh, collection, response collection, in that case, we can have a look to this method new. Uh, this is simply uh, an empty uh, set uh, map of uh, responses because it's uh, just started and the whole set of uh, subsystem and sending um, so we send uh, and sending a sub, a sub request is just uh, sending a message uh, whereas, yeah, sending sub, sub, sub status request this is sending a uh, a status request to a given name. You can notice that there is a, um, 
a type that is a bit complex here because I am standing a status request, but this guy is able to send different kind of requests, status requests, but also global status responses. So I have to tell uh, to the message box, oh, this is uh, this one is a status request and not a global response. Uh, we will see um, some way to improve that later. And now I've sent my uh, uh, request. This item will just continue his event loop and uh, receive, uh, uh, hopefully, a, a status response coming from the different actors. And uh, uh, managing a status response is, again, something I just have um, to uh, uh, update my state. I have a new response, so I pull this response to my set of uh, responses. And I have to probe, uh, is uh, something else, uh, still pending? If none, Oh, it's done. So I have to take the response and to send that response uh, to the cloud. So now if I want to test this actor, the key point will be to um, uh, this, uh, this function that will spawn an actor. So uh, mostly I will have to create my actor with uh, this uh, state and this message box and to spawn uh, Sub process behind the scene where the actor run. So the job is done here. And the key point is I need to uh, interact with this actor. I need to be able to send message in and to uh, observe what is sent by this uh, actor. So I will build another, I will build two message box, one given to the actor and another one that is used for testing purpose. And these two message box are connected in such a way that when I send a message from this message box, this message will be received by the actor and vice versa. If the actor sends a message, a message uh, uh, the test message box will receive this message. So uh, pre uh, to prepare a test, I just have to spawn my actor and to return a message box that is connected to the actor. And then I can play with the actor, so I, I spawn my actor. I can simulate a request coming from the cloud. I can check, this is a check. I can check that uh, this actor has, has sent a request per subservice. So in that case, uh, I will uh, for all the subsystems, I will check that indeed I receive a status request with an uh, appropriate name. The order doesn't matter, so I have some tools to uh, to ease the testing. And now I have to uh, simulate the child devices. So in that case, using the uh, message box, I can send uh, messages. So this guy says up, this guy says down, um, this one uh, uh, say oh, I don't know which states I, I, I am. And I can continue my test just uh, in that case to um, uh, assess, assess that uh, the actor behind the scenes send something that I can receive on this test message box. And this uh, message is the response to the cloud. And I have to, uh, I can double check that the response is what's uh, just a aggregation of all the sub responses. I will just um, move to uh, some intermediate state where I, I will improve the way we manage the, um, uh, the messages. Uh, pre uh, so I change nothing on the messages itself, but uh, I, instead of using a simple message box, now I use something a bit more involved where I introduce a distinction between a receiver for the inputs and, and now I use two senders. I'm able to send messages on two different uh, box. And so I have, um, this is done for many purposes. Just for um, a cosmetic change, since I have a specific message box to send uh, messages to the um, cloud or to some uh, peers, the same messages uh, functions will be uh, simpler. I don't have to create but uh, an envelope around my uh, messages, I can send directly them because this um, 
channel is ready to receive this kind of messages. But this is kind of cosmetic, uh, more cosmetic than uh, other thing. Another, uh, what will be very important uh, for um, actual actors will be to uh, to choose when uh, having a specific um, way to, uh, channel to receive a specific way to, uh, channel to send will be uh, very important if you want to coordinate to say oh. I will expect on this uh, this time only messages from these guys and not that one to 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 share repeat what you are doing. Um, for testing purpose, it's changed a, uh, a bit, but because now I will have to interact with two message box: one that simulates the cloud, another one that simulates the local. Um, uh, actor, and again, I will have to. Um, Establish connections. You can notice uh, something a, a, a slight different between the two. Um, this is simply because uh, this actor is using behind the scene uh, the local message box. So I will have to provide this message box directly when I build the actor. While the actor publish uh, some API the ability to have uh, global uh, connections and this is uh, the cloud will use that well in practice the mapper for the cloud uh, will use these connections so there is some asymmetry here but this is a detail and now we have two message box one for the cloud one for local interaction and the states are the same just uh, a bit clearer uh, this is message sent by the cloud. Uh, this is message is received by local by the child devices. Again, something sent by child devices, and something received by the cloud. And now I would like to move to an, uh, another step, adding um, timeouts. Oh, oh yeah, <laughs> I was a bit afraid. Um, so I'm adding the ability to, uh, I send a request to a child device, but this guy is down, or at least uh, there is a huge latency. So I would just say to the cloud, oh, I, I don't know what's the state of this um, uh, actor. To implement this, so we need to, to use another actor. So. Uh, uh, we will have to connect a, to an, a timer actor that will uh, receive a set timeouts for a given uh, information and free as a, a user to uh, pick uh, the event type I put here. So in that case, I will use system name. Uh, please, I, I would like to set a timeout for this guy. And I will receive responses. Uh, oh, uh, time elapsed for this guy. And so I. I in the actor itself, I would change the status. I will have a new type uh, that is a status timeout. And I will add a new channel uh, for the to receive the response. So I will have um, one input channel where I receive, I gather a different kind of events, and I will have three independent outputs uh, to send the responses, to send sub requests, and also to set timers. Before uh, uh, just where I do, where so, so when I send a status request to a child device, I will have also to send a timer request to so to a different actor. Uh, please, uh, can you awake me uh, in five seconds just to double check this this guy has received or not uh, send it or not is a response. And I will have to handle a new kind of messages. Uh, in that case, uh, just to uh, I have nothing specific to to say. I would just mimic if I have, uh, so I have a timeout. It just means that uh, the status of uh, this guy is unknown, and the um, the fact that I know that this is this system, this child device, and not another is simply because the status timeout um, is an envelope to something uh, to some event. Uh, pass to when I send this device. So when I send this timer status, I say, oh, this is for this subsystem. And five minutes after, I will receive this message with the same um, 
status uh, system subsystem name. And here I mimic a uh, status response. And the test will be the same, similar again. This time I will have three boxes. And I will be able to uh, uh, mimic uh, so uh, a timeout. So instead of uh, uh, I will receive two uh, peers as telling us their own state, this guy will uh, never respond and they will have a time timeout. Just very simple. Uh, no, it's no more an example. This is uh, a device management uh, uh, process. We are preparing to have a, a, a huge process to have all the community related uh, features regarding device management. So configuration, uh, firmware, uh, logging, and and. This is the code for this uh, actor. So we can see that the, the code of um, a new uh, a process will be just a main, and that main will be uh, so to use some configuration to build some actors to connect them. So for instance, this configuration actor need to run uh, need to some MQTT connection, some HTTP connection, a timer. Um, an actor that will uh, use eNotify to uh, watch the file system and so on. To connect all these actors and to run them and run to conversion. So having to add or remove an actor from a, ma a main will be just a matter to uh, remove or add the uh, proper lines here. So, um, so doing, we have no, uh, I, I think everything is, we just had to, to, to finalize uh, the map, uh, some points in the map and the, in the agent to have refactor everything using actors. And um, this in, not only will improve um, the way we have more modular uh, components focus just on one thing. For instance, the configuration management uh, has no knowledge of MQTT beyond send, uh, this message, this envelope somehow, and uh, no uh, true connection to MQTT, no connection to HTTP, nothing, just something that is focused on configuration management. And sometimes more flexibility to be able to uh, uh, have more, uh, yeah, to combine different actors into a single main and also to improve testability and observability because we will be able to observe all these messages running uh, flowing, uh, flowing in the system. So yes, we are now prepared to the next challenges and uh, this will be to uh, improve the external API and the uh, experience of Synage. Up to you, Phil. Uh, so. Excellent. Thank, thanks, Didier. Thanks. It's uh, really interesting to see how how things are evolving. So I think every, everything in the work has been quite accelerated, isn't it? So moving forwards, helping organisations uh, with, with what they want to do. So it's very, very interesting stuff. So has anybody got any questions or uh, queries to Didier? Because I know we've gone through quite a lot. And maybe one question from myself, Didier. So you, you indicated that now sort of um, we've, we've done one part of the, the refactoring. Um, can you add a bit more detail about what the next phase is? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, there, there are many things. Um, I, I think we need to refactor the, the organization, the packaging of Synage. Today we have too many um, daemons. And this is uh, this makes the packaging a uh, bit more complicated and more complex. And this is also more difficult for uh, you uh, to deploy everything to have everything working. So we plan to to move for, uh, to another organization where we have uh, say uh, device management uh, daemon that is doing everything uh, in one piece of code, some battery included uh, component. This is one direction. And uh, 
we we also need to work on the um, this why uh, this question about MQTT or HTTP to improve extension point. For instance, I said a word about uh, the configuration plugin. Uh, today we have something that is running, it's nice, but you have no way to uh, uh, to 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 implement your own configuration management, say for um, uh, Azure or for you. If you want to tweak something, we need to have an API here. So we need to 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 improve the API over MQTT HTTP, and uh, yeah, too. And to have something that is defined for all and every uh, features. Yep. Uh, and, excellent, excellent. And, and oh, maybe Ruben, one more addition. So I think one of the kind of features that will benefit greatly from the actor model is the implementation of the device profile feature. Because in a sense, the device profile is a combination of software, configuration, and firmware management. And so that the kind of composability that the actor model brings us means that we can better reuse the existing code to implement the device profiles. So that's why uh, from the kind of feature development part, we've been postponing the device profiles because of the actor model, because we really want to get that um, in. Uh, so to make the implementation a lot easier for us, um, but that's only the first feature that will be easier for development side. Um, I believe that this actor refactoring will have a massive increase on our productivity. Um, so I think you'll be able to deliver more quicker and also better, better tested um, because the testability aspect and the observability aspect is very, very nice. Not only from like a developer point of view, but also if in the future we have people contributing the projects, that's a little bit easier to see what's going on and it reduces a little bit of the complexity. So I think, I think moving forward, you'll see a lot of benefits uh, uh, come from the actor model. Excellent, excellent. Thanks, Ruben. Thanks, Studio. I, I know we've kind of run out of time. There's probably many questions that people can raise uh, as, as well, but, but if you have any questions, please raise those. Um, uh, afterwards or during the during the session with the, the remaining time we have so uh with with that i'd like to move on to our our next topic so so staying with the updates in release 0 0.10 let's deep dive into another feature evolution so according to uh, edward amorozo it's a former csi a ciso of at t the need to create world-class firmware update processes is no longer optional. Where firmware update management was once considered a nice to have, it has now evolved to be one of the central elements of any successful security program. However, updating firmware is time consuming, can be risky, and can require a system reboot and downtime. So I would like to introduce Rina Frugino, the software developer from the Finnish IO team, who will demonstrate how ThinEdge.io provides an easy way for the firmware on all connected child devices to be updated in an efficient and robust manner. So Rina, over to you. Yes, yeah, thanks, Phil. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Rina Fuzino, a software engineer from ThinEdge.io team. So today I'm here to introduce the new feature available since our 0 0.10 release. So that is a firmware management support for child device for Cumulosity IoT. Many IoT devices uh, need firmware update regularly in their device lifecycle. With IoT Cloud Platform, uh, you can always check which firmware is currently installed in your IoT devices. And not only that, and also uh, you can apply a new firmware update to those devices. So supporting the firmware management feature is absolutely important for IoT device side clients uh, like ThinHIO. And gladly, now we have it for you. So to enable the firmware management feature, uh, firstly, we need to use Cumulosity. So let's check together now what Cumulosity offers for firmware update from their user guide. So yeah. I'm going to 
switch to the community user guide and here uh, you can find a section like managing device from here so what they are offering first they have from your repository and in this repository uh, you can create an the from your entry and providing the some from your information like name version and also um you can upload the from your file direct to community or uh, providing an external URL. And once you created the entry and this is available in your tenant and then go to the, your device management and your uh, device. Uh, if your device is declared CHY underscore firmware as supported operations, then you are going to have this firmware tab in your device. Um, so this is really cumulosity feature. So if the device wants to have some device management feature, the device always need to declare which one uh, it's supporting. So in this case, it will firmware for restart, see it restart and so on. And from this uh, device management, so you can create an operation to apply the firmware to your device. So to create an operation, so you need uh, this firmware repository entry, so which I explained in the previous section. So actually, so this is what Cumulosity is offering. And now let's take a look at what we are offering. Okay, back to the slide and Yes, um, so now we know what community offers. And then actually the firmware management feature, uh, so it's available for both main device and child device. However, in this presentation, uh, we would like to focus on only child device uh, because uh, this is what we are offering currently. So let's think about the flow and each component in the firmware update. So we need apparent three components, Kubernetes, um, as a uh, IoT platform, and also the thing as a device as main device and uh, child device. In this diagram, yes, there is only one child device, uh, but child device can be always more than one. And Cumulosity and the CNH device are connected over the internet. And the CNH device and the child devices are connected in the private network. So that key point is there's no direct connection between Cumulosity and the child devices. So the CNH device works as a proxy between cloud and the child devices. Then as per from your operation, uh, we need a couple of steps between these three components. So that's why you see now many arrows in this diagram, uh, but we can divide uh, these arrows into two parts. At the first part, this part is the responsibility of CHY firmware plugin. So we delivered this plugin in the 0 0.10 release. And this plugin is supposed to run on the Stinget device. And the other part uh, is the responsibility of the child connector. Uh, this program child connector should be running on the child devices. So unfortunately, it is not a part of Stinget IO itself because imagine it's totally different on the device how you can install the firmware. But don't worry, uh, we have an example program in our GitHub repository. And actually, I'm going to use the example Python script, which is available in the example repository in today's demo. So as I already mentioned demo in the previous slide, so I prepared a demo to show the primary management feature in today's presentation. And here is my demo setup. So CH. IO is installed and already running on the Raspberry Pi, and this one is already connected to the Cumulosity. And also, I have other two devices. So one is laptop, and the other is another Raspberry Pi, and both are located in my home network. And 
uh, child connect uh, program is running on the both devices. So let's start the demo. Okay. Um, so this device uh, is the Raspberry Pi, which is connecting the cumulosity. So this is a CHIO device. And of course, CNG is installed, the version 0.10.0. .0. And also now we can confirm that this device is really connected to Cumulosity. Um, and yes, so the connection check to the Cumulosity is successful. And for the later usage, um, I'm subs so subscribing uh, or MQTT message on the main device, CNG device. And this device is another Raspberry Pi. It's a so child device for this demo. And this child connect program is running now. And also, this is another device laptop. Uh, the same, so the child connector program is running on there. OK, so this is the device side setup. And now we can check the cumulosity. So, this ARPA 250 is my uh, Synth device. And having two child devices, one is laptop and the other is Raspberry Pi. And so first let's start with this laptop one. Uh, we can create a firmware operation. So I have already uh, created a couple of entries in the firmware repository. So that's why you can see the four entries here. So I'd like to install this version 1.0. The file itself is very lightweight, so just a simple text. And when I click install, an operation will be created. And I click install, so that some status changes very quickly, and we can confirm that. So here, so I created the operation. Then afterwards, um, the operation status changed to executing, and in the end, changed to the successful. So something happened apparently. And also let's do the same thing for this Raspberry Pi, another child device. Apply the same, same version, this 1.0, then install. Yes, now also doing the same. So create an operation, change executing, and status successful. And and also here, so this is a information of the currently installed firmware. So it actually changed to this version 1.0. So yeah, this is a small set of demo. And I think now you are curious what happened behind this demo. Then of course I'm going to explain now. So back to the slides. Okay. Yep. So previous slide I mentioned there are nine steps. So I'm going to explain from the step one. So this is a step one. So when you create a new firmware operation in Cumulosity, Cumulosity publishes a new smart list message and CH device uh, receives it. Yep. And this is a payload of the smart list message. One remarkable is this URL is a target firmware files URL. So somewhere available in the internet. Then number two, uh, so CHIO device uh, downloads a firmware file from Cumulosity or the, some external location. And from the smart rest message, so now CHIO device knows from where to download the firmware file. Then after downloading, the file will be stored in the cache. And actually, this is a feature of CHY firmware plugin. So since having a cache, it avoids re-downloading the same file again. So imagine uh, you have multiple child devices and want to apply the same firmware to them. Of course, you don't want to download the same file again and again as per operation. So this cache feature is in very helpful for this situation. So then move on to the step three. And now the target file, the firmware file, is available inside the CHIO device. So the CHIO device can create a firmware update request to the child device. So this one is sent as the MQTT message in the payload. It's like this. 
uh, ID. Uh, this is uh, signed internally and attempt. This is how many times the same request is sent. A name version, obvious, and the SHA-256. Uh, this is a checksum of the file itself so that you can verify if the file is correct after downloading. And the last one is the important URL. And this is the endpoint accessible in the local network. So most likely this parent IP part is like, for example, 192.168.68 uh, something. So the point is it's not like publicly available. So just local network, then you can access. Then, uh, then step four, uh, is now a uh, child device knows all necessary information to proceed the firmware update request. So the step four and the step five about updating the operation status to executing. And child device uh, should report uh, that a child device is now executing the request by MQTT. Then um, CHIO device converts the message to the Kubernetes format. So it's smart rest. So now the status of the variation in cumulosity changed to executing. And one note uh, is this step is actually optional. Uh, if you skip this step and executing status uh, update to cumulosity will be sent together with the successful failed status update message. So it's a, this, this eight and nine. And then and step six, so now child device can download the file, from your file from the CHIO device. Okay, then now child device has a file, so do the firmware installation. And after the firmware installation finishes, a child device reports the operation status to CHIO device uh, with a payload. If it is successful, very simple. If it is failed, also you can add the reason field, so why it failed. Then uh, CHIO devices device uh, converts the operation up status update message to the Cumulosity's way against smartness. And then now Cumulosity's operation status must be changed to either successful or failed. And if uh, some error occurs, uh, like onward steps, uh, then a CHIO device sends failure, operation failure to cumulative IoT with uh, corresponding the reason. Okay, so let's uh, check the demo's output again to confirm uh, if the demo worked as I explained now. So screen out and check it. Yep. So the step one uh, was to receive a smart risk message from Cumulosity IoT. So we have some uh, MQTT output. This is on the CNC device. And we run actually two operations. So one set of operations is this one. And this first message is the smart risk message to about this farming update from Cumulosity. Okay, now. CH device received, and step two is downloading the file from this URL. And let's check it. So, so as I said, we have cache. So this cache is the file. Now it's downloaded from the demo, so I, we can check the timestamp. Uh, cache. Yes. So it's so very really recent, it's created. So it has actually one more time difference. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so remember, so I actually created the two operations uh, applying the same firmware file to two different child devices. But now you see only one file here. So first operation, uh, actually the CNC device downloaded the file from Cumulosity, but for the second operation, since the same firmware file is required, it doesn't download. So just it's keep downloading and using this cache. And the step three is um, creating the firmware request to the child device, and the message is this one. And step four is um, 
At step four and five is uh, executing a message to Cumulosity. So these two are corresponded messages. And step six, uh, downloading the firmware file from CHIO device. So we can check our child device connector output. So look at this. So here, so apparently uh, this child connector is downloading a file from the uh, CHIO device and the download was successful and stored somewhere. So step six was done. And step seven is insta installing a firmware file, so it does something. And then number eight and nine is um, sending the, again, operation status update. And these three messages are corresponding to that. So child connector sends a successful message. And then CHIO device converts to the smartest way. So this is a for successor, and this is updating the Cumulus inventory data, so which uh, uh, firmware file is currently installed. So yeah, it looks good. So now we confirm that um, the demo worked as I explained in with this diagram. So the this goes a summary. So this is the last part of my demo and our presentation. Uh, so the feature, so firmware management for Cumulus IoT is available since 0.10.0 release as CTY firmware plugin service. And as of today, only child devices are supported. And also the child device connector program uh, must be run on the child devices. If you are interested in this feature, uh, we have how to guide. So please leave this one and try it. And also this child device connector program, we have it in this repository. So since IO example repository, so also you can use it. OK, and then thanks for listening. This is end of my presentation and over to you, Phil. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks, Rina. Thanks, Rina. So it's a great presentation, Rina. So it definitely clearly showed how we can do FOMA management to assure the uh, the software compliance on child devices, which is now an essential component, as um, it indicated before. So thank you, thank you very much. Brilliant, brilliant presentation. So coming back to coming to, back to another uh, another feature we actually have packed into release uh, 0 0.10. So uh, in its simplest form, remote access provides an authenticated user with visibility to control. Uh, visibility and control of a remote device for development and troubleshooting. In the most sophisticated form, remote access combined with automated device management provides enterprises with the tools to completely transform their field service operations. So I would like to welcome back uh, Ruben, who will demonstrate how ThinEdge.io has been extended to support many uh, features of uh, remote access. So uh, Ruben, uh, over to you. Hey, thanks, Phil. So my name is Ruben Miller. I'm the product owner of ThinEdge. Um, so I wanted to talk about um, the remote access feature uh, that was introduced since 0 0.10. And I want to go through a bit of a demo and then try to um, better explain how it kind of what's working under the hood and to better understand it and see what kind of uh, to demystify some of the magic there. So. What is the remote access feature? So it's a Commonwealth specific feature uh, that gives users access to the device um, for via other TCP based protocols. Uh, so other TCP based protocols such as SSH, VNC. Um, so to be able to access the device using other tooling, not that just the MQTT um, or HTTP kind of interfaces. So First of all, why would you want to do this? Let's remove that. So in the perfect world, everything just works. However, we don't live in the perfect world, so uh, there's often cases where maybe your IoT device is misbehaving, either because you've deployed new applications on it and you kind of need to have a better understanding of what's going on. Um, so the remote access feature allows you to better do your advanced debugging on these devices. Uh, so you can maybe do advanced kind of uh, interactive debugging sessions. Um, so ThinEdge already provides like log management and shell execution. However, for the really tricky problems, 
you sometimes need a little bit more to actually, you know, SSH onto the device to really see what's going on and see, you know, do some greps over some logs um, to better diagnose the problem and then maybe roll out the fix later on. Another common use case is maybe the, your IoT device is running some kind of local UI. And because it's we're talking about IoT devices, you generally don't want to then have a open port where you make the UI available. Um, so you can actually, you might only want to restrict it to the local host. So it's not then publicly accessible uh, outside of the network or like a, from the device, um, but you still want to access this UI. So the remote access then allows you to do port forwarding. Um, so you can actually access securely this local endpoint, and it can also be then encrypted via SSH. So the common, uh, the ways that we definitely use it, and I've uh, used it with other customers. Uh, so the interactive SSH sessions is very, very useful um, because it also makes the device accessible from anywhere else or anywhere in the world. Um, and because you're not publishing your open parts, um, you can do it securely. And because you have SSH, you can also then do SCP, so secure copy. Um, so you can actually do transfer then files from your laptop to that remote device using your SSH connection. As I said before, you can do port forwarding again with SSH. Um, I believe we also have some customers using um, debugging code sys applications um, by also using the TCP proxy part and be able to, I think, run the application live and see what the, the actual values are in the control program which is running. Uh, and also uh, VNC is available. So if you, if you have some kind of desktop application running on your device, then you can also access the UI via that. So now let's actually see what's, uh, see this feature in action. Uh, so what I'm gonna demo is how to access then your node red, which is running on the device itself. So we'll start off with, so uh, the kind of construct of this kind of use case. So ThinEdge is more of a vehicle to deliver your IoT solution. So it's a fundamental part of your IoT solution because it does the cloud connection and that facilitates a lot of the hard to do things so you don't have to implement yourself. However, the real value is then maybe you, what IoT applications and the customization that you want to do. So you can already deploy the applications via the software management features uh, from ThinEdge, but then you might want to do additional features like create a custom flow in Node-RED. So what I want to show is, so I have Node-RED running on the device. And now I want to actually access the UI and see what's going on there because maybe my workflow is not working correctly. So here we have, so the Comlocity uh, device here, so that's my Raspberry Pi. And now all I want to do is connect to this device and do a port forwarding. So I'm just trying to port forward the 1880 from the remote device to my local port 1880. And this is the device I'm connecting to. So this is the device there. So if I just press enter now, it will establish my connection. We should actually see here because I have a um, an automatic event uh, notification that I've created when a shell session gets added that I can see, hey, it's doing something. So my SSH session has started and the what user started it, et cetera. So once I'm in here, because I've done the port forwarding, I can actually then access this local port. So this is running on the device. And so I can see that on the device that I have a temperature flow running. So this is a simple uh, node red flow that I created uh, just for demonstration purposes which subscribes to the measurements and looks for temperature measurements, looks for if there's a significant change in the temperature, creates an event accordingly. So for example, that would be a classic if you have a sensor and if the temperature spikes, um, you know, jumps 10 degrees suddenly, that usually is an indication that the sensor is dead. Um, so you can do a bit of like, uh, get a notification when you might need to change out the sensor. 
So I can do all the things that you would normally do in Node-RED. So you can even you know, adjust the project and redeploy it uh, and everything via securely um, via the remote access feature. Uh, so this device could also be, you know, sitting anywhere else in the world, and it's then secured access using my Comvolocity credentials um, that are provided here. Uh, so you don't need to do extra user management or anything. Everything's just kind of very conveniently linked with your IoT solution. So let's have a look at the flow just to kind of show for demonstration purposes. Uh, so currently, let me just do a split screen. So the moment I have some temperature data here, so I'm just going to simulate some data um, and we'll, I'll do a slow ramp. So I'm just going to go from 20 to 25 degrees and then back down. But because I'm doing one degree increments, this shouldn't, this isn't like a significant change in my temperature. Uh, so I shouldn't actually get any events. And we can see kind of the measurements flowing in. So it kind of ramps up and ramps down. But if I look at the events, then I don't have any events here. But if we do the same thing now with using a temperature spike, so here I'm jumping from 20 to 30 degrees, back down to 25. And then suddenly I get a temperature event and everything's good and working correctly. So now maybe I wanted to kind of see, you know, dig around what's on the device. Um, or, or let's simulate when something goes wrong. So I can do all my normal commands here. So if I just stop the service, maybe node red. Actually confused because I'm doing port forwarding. Let me just kill that. So let's imagine that you start on this device and then part of my Node-RED um, application is Node -red, um, that I also have using the new service monitoring. So I also have an indication that when, for whatever reason, that the uh, Node-RED application isn't running, I see you have a error notification here that my service is down. So that's my first indication, oh, something's not running properly. So I look there and going, well, hmm, I don't really know what to, you know, what the error could be. So, you know, this is where kind of connecting uh, via SSH might be useful. So I can then connect to my device using SSH and then have a bit of a poke around. So I could even do like a journal CTL and have a look there interactively and going, Okay, you know, that looks okay because that's not really saying it's not running. But if I look at the service status, it confirmed that it's inactive and dead. And they go, ah, okay, yep, I accidentally stopped it. So let's start it again. And we can see it's now doing stuff. So providing that kind of SSH access is super useful just for those quick and trickier situations um, where it might not be obvious then from the UI in Comolocity uh, what's actually going on. Um, so it's providing both uh, additional UI features, but also like um, troubleshooting features. And we can now see that my node red application is now green again. So the, the flow is then up and running and yeah. So what's actually happening under the hood? Or actually, before I do that, so one way of accessing it is via this, it's called native SSH. So by doing a native SSH client um, using the pass through feature, um, you can also access it via the web SSH. We have the window here, and then you can, so that's handy if you don't have maybe a, a a client which has direct access to it for whatever reason. Uh, so you can do the same stuff here. Red. And so everything's kind of working as expected. The only difference is because it's web SSH, it's slightly slower than native SSH, um, but it can be good for the kind of quick once off kind of interactive sessions. Um, but the native SSH slash uh, pass through feature 
is definitely one of my favorite features because you can also do everything that you can do in SSH. You can do once off commands, um, SCP and all that kind of magic stuff, which is a lot more convenient and it feels a lot more uh, snappier in terms of like the response because there's basically less of a kind of, you know, a back and forth in between the different kind of components. So how is all this magic working? So to do that, I'll show it in the um, in PowerPoint. So how does all of this work? So in the end, let's say you have a power user that wants to access the device um, via SSH. So SSH always needs a client and a daemon or service. So that's represented here. In normal scenarios, or if you're in the local network, then you might be able to oops, establish these connections directly because maybe you're in a secured network um, where that's okay. However, if your device is hang, um, connected to the internet directly, then generally that is very frowned upon because it's not very secure and then anyone um, can access your device from the internet uh, and that's generally something you don't want. So how do we then make this secure? So before we do this, we need to add a bit of infrastructure stuff in. So we've added the, the Commonwealth City IoT platform. We have ThinEdge here, which then has an always running uh, MQC connection to the IoT platform. Then we also have the remote access plugin, which was then introduced in 0 0.10 from ThinEdge. So this is a separate binary. It's not a process which is always running. It's just a binary which is then called by ThinEdge uh, when it receives an operation. Then on the left side, so the clients or the power users laptop, um, we need an additional piece of software, which is also an open source uh, project, a small project written in Python um, that is called the Comelocity Local Proxy. So that knows how to talk to Comelocity um, and that acts as the local proxy. So the go between between the SSH and the cloud. So when the user wants to connect uh, to the remote device via SSH, they start the session saying SSH, my device. Using standard SSH configuration, you can actually configure that saying, hey, when I access this device, I want you to use the local proxy um, to call this application, which is running on your device. So it proxies the command there saying, ah, I need to do something before I can actually establish the connection. So please, please execute that. The local, oops. The local proxy then creates an operation, Comelocity. It then establishes a WebSocket, which is then an always on or like a running connection. Comelocity then in turn sends an operation from the cloud to the ThinEdge device, which already has, you know, receives it by the MQC publish. That interprets the message and go, ah, okay, this is a remote access request. It calls remote access plugin. The remote access plugin then establishes its own WebSocket to the cloud, and the cloud kind of joins this socket with this socket, and it just proxies it using a transparent proxy. So it just goes, okay, bytes in, bytes out um, in both directions. And then from then on, once that connection is then established, then the WebSocket is then proxied to the SSH daemon. So in the end, um, semantically, you're, we have this bidirectional arrow here, but it's kind of going through this kind of uh, this path here. So this is all um, kind of stuff that happens under the hood. It's kind of implementation details that the user doesn't really have to worry about too much um, because everything can still work by the SSH configuration. So it works so everything just feels like native that it just works out of the box. So, you know, nothing like a, if I was connecting to my, you know, that IP address, that just works exactly how I'd use um, SSH in normal circumstances. Uh, so it's just an additional SSH configuration, which is required to facilitate that. And then everything just works as expected. So we have a few references here um, that you can check out the, the local proxy uh, project. Um, and also the documentation. If you're not familiar with the cloud remote access, 
uh, because you have to make sure you have the right permissions. Uh, so we have a link to the documentation uh, from Commolocity, how to enable that. So I think moving forward, it's a, an enabler for any project because as your IoT project grows, you have more and more components being added and you know the more uh, chance that something will go wrong or even in the development phase, it's very helpful that you can kind of track and easily connect to your device uh, and it simplifies the connectivity to the devices um, because you're not just relying on being in the local network. Uh, so it's very convenient for us as a team because we're not located in the same uh, regions as we can actually also access all of our test devices by this feature as well. So that concludes my demo for the remote access feature and back to you, Phil. Excellent. Thanks, Ruben. Brilliant, brilliant demo. So, so as, as Ruben indicated, so um, remote access is sort of really powerful in many different circumstances and be, they've been sort of packed into or prepackaged into Synergy.io. Initially for Cumulosity IoT provides uh, provides many benefits and also makes it simpler to use. So we now move on to our uh, our last session, and we've we've saved we've saved the um, the best the best for last. So um, not no no uh, no negative to anybody so far, but containerization brings many benefits, including uh, software portability between platforms, resource efficiency over virtual machines, and improved application isolation. Each container packages up packages up the code and all its dependencies like runtime, system tools, system libraries, and settings. However, managing these containers can prove to be a challenge and additional software is needed to optimize how to run containers and monitor their health. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Murat Bayram, so software architect at, software, at um, software AG, who will demonstrate how ThinEdge um, IO enables containers to be managed in resource restricted edge devices. So Murat, over to you. Thank you, Phil. So thank you very much for the introduction. So today uh, we are going to show you so how how basically you can use Cumulosity IoT to manage containers together with ThinEdge. So how uh, ThinEdge plugins can extend the functionalities of uh, ThinEdge and how also micro front ends can extend the functionalities UI wise on the Cumulosity side. Um, let me so now two screens a little bit difficult. So I mean, you know that that picture or that architecture, right? So I mean, this is the the framework for, from ThinEdge that basically shows that we have an MQTT broker and working with uh, several applications or plugins that can extend the functionalities of ThinEdge. And what you see here on the right side is basically that you can have multiple different yeah cloud vendors, so to say, uh, such as for example uh, Azure. Um, or uh, AWS, but also uh, Cumulosity IT. And this is why I'm here today, because I, I'm working for Software AG uh, and basically showing you today how container management can be achieved with Cumulosity IoT uh, together with ThinEdge IO. Uh, when we talk about Cumulosity IoT, then uh, this is a, a multi tenant IoT platform. Um, that is highly scalable, uh, works with multiple thousand, even million, millions of devices, and um, um, has a huge stack of functionalities, uh, which works in many different environments, such as uh, cloud, uh, um, cloud on uh, clouds on hyperscalers such as Azure or AWS, um, or even in on-premises or edge deployments. So um, we are cloud agnostic in that way. Uh, such that customers that do not want to go to the cloud, for example, can also do the full stack of these functionalities here on a dedicated edge instance, for example. And uh, when Cumulosity started, um, actually quite a couple of years ago, uh, they started with the initial functionality stack that was device connectivity and management, because all the other use cases you see in, in terms of uh, IoT use cases such as dashboarding, condition monitoring, data visualization, and even the uh, higher aggregated use cases such as integration to ticketing systems, for example, or um, uh, stuff like predictive maintenance, requires that your sensors, your devices, your your whatever the thing is you want to connect needs to be connected and 
maintainable and manageable uh, via remote because you do not want to drive around and, and do patching and firmware uh, updates or configurations uh, all over the world via, via people. Uh, and when we talk about uh, device management, we actually mean the full life cycle of devices. So when a device is born, so provision and, and organizing it, um, so basically, what, what is this device? Uh, who does it belong to? So all the stuff about identity management certificates. Um, but even in the while while it's running and working and doing what it should do, um, uh, watching it, so to say, so monitoring it, seeing that uh, some device data is uh, created, how it's configured, um, and then doing some troubleshooting or diagnosis such as Ruben just showed it via the uh, uh, remote access or getting some log files and then decommission it. For example, if you ship it to another customer, um, you you sell it, you you change parts, etc. So, so Cumulosity IoT offers here the full stack of all functionalities that is needed alongside the device cycle, uh, the, the device life cycle. And today we are Focusing, so I, I could give like a talk for every of these bubbles, like for an hour, but today we are, we are basically jumping into the software management part and um, we'll show you uh, how Cumulosity IT handles the software management. And for that, we are jumping into a tenant. So that's a demo tenant. Um, if you want to, you can create your own uh, trial uh, demo tenant. Um, Phil will put in the link later on in the chat. Um, and what you can basically do here in the application that is called the device management, um, you can you can manage your devices. And management is in both directions, meaning you could, for example, first of all, see what your device is doing, so whether it's connected or not, how it consists of, so what is my what's the, the name of the device, when was it last updated, when was it created, what what version of Synage is running here, so. Basically, it's meta information to the device. And then here on the left side, you have multiple tabs where all the different device management uh, functionalities or capabilities are, are located. So for example, configuration management that is already um, uh, solved with ThinHIO, for example, or uh, requesting log files. Um, and uh, what also Ruben showed with the remote access via, for example, SSH and VNC. And of course, there's a tab software, and there comes uh, already uh, something that is very generic in the Cumulosity speak. Uh, is we we basically software is a very generic approach here. So software can be anything for for us, right? So uh, depending on how you package something, we talk about something we call a software type. So software types can be, and just give you some impressions, and and Phil will put in a. a uh, 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 Paul, uh, in in a couple of seconds. Um, so software types can be, for example, Docker Composes. Uh, so then it's basically a Docker Compose YAML, or it can be Docker Images, uh, APKs, binaries, executable files. So anything that that can be a software from our point of view, and we declare it with uh, something we call a software type. Meaning that with this uh, functionality here, you could, for example, update software in here of a certain type. So, for example, I've running here in RabbitMQ broker on my ThinEdge device. So I can update that, for example. I could delete the MongoDB that is running here, or I can even install new software. Um, for example, the, I don't know, VPN tool. Don't know what it is, but we do have that here. And with that uh, functionalities here, I can update, delete, or install any type of software. And ThinEdge solves this with, uh, with software management plugins for various types of software types. There was a lot of types in it. So, I mean, of course, if I do have a Docker container, this installation is different than if I have a Docker Compose or if I do have a Debian package. And depending on that, the ThinEdge handles this differently via plugins. So to give you an impression, uh, what is basically happening behind the scenes? If I do that in terms of software management, then I do have my broker that is for the inter-process communication. And I do have the MQTT bridge that is basically taking care that um, internal messages on certain topics 
are up mapped to what Cumulosity IT um, requires to understand that uh, there should something happen. And then I do have the CNY agent that is basically understanding, okay, there's now a software update for software type Dogger, for example, of a certain yeah, Dogger container or a binary or an URL. And then it basically looks which plugin it should use, right? So a software plugin, very generic. So it uses the Dogger plugin, it uses the uh, APT plugin or whatever plugin is needed uh, for the particular software type. And then of course doing it and uh, getting uh, sending back the information to the Cumulosity IoT. The thing now, and this is why I'm shifting now to the demo again, this view is very generic. So meaning that um, we made it that way that it works basically for all types of software uh, that I want to install. But uh, when we are talking now about Docker and there would be a question whether you are using containerization uh, and what type of containerization you are using, um, we see that, for example, Dogger or Podman or even Dogger Compose require actually a, a different type of visualization, right? So this view in terms of, okay, I see that RabbitMQ as a container is running, but I have no clue about commands, port mapping, etc. that this view is not working for people that really want to manage the containers running on the devices. And Cumulosity is very extensible here in, in the way that you can create um, via um, micro frontends own additions to the standard platform. So uh, if I say, for example, I want to have a own container view, I can basically just add that my own. And this is what we did here. So we added a container tab and now we created the view as we thought it might make sense. So I do have here a, a view uh, in a grid view where I can basically see all my containers. So you see MongoDB is running here with the, with the status it's up. The Postgres database in, uh, in as a container basically just exited. Um, RabbitMQ is still running or the MQTT broker is locally running since Vintage requires that, for example. And with this three dots in here, I have the possibility to yeah, restart the container, to stop it or to start it if it's stopped or even to jump in into that container and see, for example, that this status is uh, running since eight hours um, and that I have a particular container ID here that I have a command with uh, the with which the container was initially started, that the network is bridged, uh, how much of the file system is used, etc. So I can basically extend it to any information that Docker PS is giving me. Um, so if you check that in here, so I just opened the command, um, here and if I do Docker PS, then you would basically see that all the information here of, uh, for example, the broker is what I'm showing here in the container tab of Cumulosity IoT. And since Docker Compose is a very nice way to yeah, compose something out of containers, <laughs> Uh, we could even do that with container groups. So this is how we named them to have it a little bit more generic in terms of um, other containerizations uh, or technologies. And in here, I have, for example, now a Docker Compose file that is called Edge Computing Pipeline. Uh, so for example, if I'm doing something with the Jupyter nodes in terms of Python that is subscribing to something, writing into a local MySQL database and having a little um, Nginx uh, web browser, uh, uh, web server. I can do that with that, for example. And here you see that the Docker Compose file basically consists of several containers. So Jupyter nodes, and again, I can open that here with a container ID, again, file system, what ports are mapped, um, what, uh, and do that also with the other um, containers and can, can, can even jump into the different containers again to see, for example, that this um, MySQL database container in the Docker Compose file is running uh, and up since eight hours, for example. So a very nice way to extend views uh, to create the very generic view of software, which is actually very generic, uh, and abstract that actually in a, in a way that I can use that for a, a certain software type. And in this example today, it was basically containers and container groups. And if we just check what is happening on uh, behind the scenes uh, way again, 
um, as you have seen that, uh, we basically now have a Docker and a Docker Compose plugin that are running and that are also in the GitHub repository. It basically does the handling of, I want to install a Docker container, I want to install a Docker Compose, and it's handling via the C8Y agent the um, yeah the whole distribution about uh, or the communication with the Docker host, so to say. And what we additionally have, and there's also in the repo where we will share the link with you, that we do have this attach container plugin. So basically also also known as a Docker host data mapper. So it's it's basically asking Docker info or Docker PS for information about the different containers and publishing that to the broker that is mapping that to Convolocity IoT data model. Thus, I can show then the actual status and all the information you just saw recently on the container and container groups um, tab in the device management of Convolocity IoT. And with that, um, yeah, just showing that this is the GitHub repo. Uh, Phil will pack the links into the chat, uh, but that's basically it from me and i hope phil i catched up some time excellent Murad. You, you definitely did you definitely did so so i think we've come to the uh the end of our session this finished our community meetup and i'd like to thank all our presenters and demonstrators so i really enjoyed it i think there's a lot of details that's actually gone through today particularly the the refactoring case which actually helps us in, in a big way longer term and i think our audience uh, like that as well. Um, I would also like to make you aware that most of the contributors uh, are actually recruiting the space. This is actually contributors for the ThinEdge.io initiative overall. So please spread the word to those in your contact networks who may want to come on board in a professional capacity to uh, many of the um, many of the contributors. And with that, I'd like to say thank you for joining us. Stay safe, and we will see you in the next meetup, which is probably going to be in early summer. So thank you for attending, and we look forward to speaking to you next time. Thanks.